if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 12. Now, it's been a couple weeks since we've been able to be, maybe three weeks, I can't remember, since we've been back in this uh, story of the kings, departed from that a little bit, and then had a problem last week that we had, and, and so we're getting back to this now, and uh, I'll have to give a little bit of a review. Now, I'm not going to have you stand up, we're not going to have a uh, uh, any set reading, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to read these first few verses and give you a review, and then little by little we'll go through um, the rest of this chapter as I preach the message. So 1 Kings chapter 12, just for reminder, uh, we see here that Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king, and it came to pass when Rehoboam the son of Nabat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he had fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt, that they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, the fa Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now, therefore, make thou the grievous service of thy... Uh, I'm sorry. Make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke which he put upon us lighter, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Depart yet for three days, then come again unto me, and the people departed. King Rehoboam consulted with the old men, and it stood before Solomon, his father, while he yet lived, and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which uh, they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him and which stood before him. And he, he said unto them, What counsel give ye that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Make, my, uh, make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. And now, whereas my father did lay on upon you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father hath chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Um, now, I've always kind of wondered what that means, chastising them with scorpions. And I don't know. Per, per, perhaps it was just literal scorpions uh, that he punished them with. Maybe, I don't know tied him in a box and put scorpions on him. <laughs> Whatever he was thinking about doing with scorpions, I, I never did understand. Then I heard this one time in like a commentary or something where somebody said it could be a reference to the name of a type of whip. You know what I mean? For, for instance, like a whip that has actual glass and stuff like that in it. Maybe they called it a scorpion or, or something. We don't know that for sure, and I don't think there's any reason to doubt that that's a possibility. Uh, but whatever the case, he's saying, my dad did this, I'm going to go above and beyond. I'm going to go rougher on you. Uh, and so uh, he said, he said, verse 12, so Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day as the king had appointed, saying, come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, my father made your yoke heavy and I will add to your yoke my father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Wherefore, the king hearkened not unto the people, for the, uh, for the cause was from the Lord um, that, might perform his, that he might perform his saints, which the Lord spake unto Ahijah the Shilonite, unto Jeroboam the son of Nabat. So I'm going to stop right there for now. Uh, I wanted to read all that just kind of a, to give a background and, and just kind of reminder, but I'm not sure if you... Follow it along, uh, probably you did, probably you know what's going on, but basically, long story short, Rehoboam, who's already been, uh, you know, he's, he's been appointed to the, to the position of the king, but God has already said through prophets that, hey, he's not going to actually uh, be, continue to be the king. In fact, this is kind of a punishment for Solomon and his sins. He said, your son, in your son's day, the kingdom's going to be stripped from him and given to another. 
And so ten kingdoms is, is supposed to be being taken away, which is going to happen in this chapter. And then he's only going to get that last kingdom uh, of Judah. Okay, I say kingdom, I'm talking about tribes. And so he would get that, uh, he'll reign over those. So then there becomes a split in the kingdom where you have northern tribes and then you have the southern uh, tribe. And so this was prophesied. This is, God already told Rehoboam that it was going to happen. And he told uh, 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 Jerob Jeroboam it's going to happen. So these guys kind of know that this is happening uh, and it's just a matter of, of time. Okay, so there's some things that I want to bring out in this story as we just kind of go through this looking at um, the rest of this chapter. And I'm going to try to bring out some application. And as usual, as I'm going through the Kings, I keep seeing application to our country. And then I can make application to any type of leadership. Sometimes you can make application to the church leadership. or uh, But I want to really try to get to the point where we're applying it to our personal life. And so hopefully I'll be able to do that by the end of this message. Okay, it's just a simple message. It probably won't be that long, but uh, I want to go through the rest of this chapter and see what's going on. So, first of all, we see that Rehoboam sees himself as kind of like the all-powerful, uh, you know, supreme one over this, uh, over this kingdom. Now, in a manner of speaking, if you've been elected king in those days, you did have all this power, and you could do a lot of things. I mean, look at what King Solomon did before him. And now he's handed over his dad's kingdom, and we already know how wonderful, magnificent it was, and how everybody just is in awe whenever they come to see the kingdom, and now it is in Rehoboam's hands. And so I look at this, and I think probably it's kind of the spoiled rich kid syndrome. <laughs> you know what I mean? Here's a kid that grew up, and obviously those young men that he seeks counsel from, by the way, Notice it says he asked the men that the the guy the the young men that grew up with him, right? So here's one spoiled rich kid probably talking to a lot of other spoiled rich kids that were in the kingdom. Maybe uh, maybe some of the con Solomon's concubines kids or something like that. I don't know, uh, but I get the feeling that he's talking to other people kind of in his social status, you know. And here's people who never really worked for their you know for for their power and their I mean, I'm not saying they didn't do any work and they didn't get any education. Obviously, they did, but it was like everything was just handed to them and, provi and provide for them. Now, I don't know about you, but the first thing that goes through my mind is we're talking about politics anyway, right, with this kingdom. Isn't that kind of true in our politics today? Like most people in, a, in leadership or put in any office, it seems like they just had it all handed to them. And when you hear them try to talk about things that relate to just the common man, it's like, I don't think they understand how this works, <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, we're having a problem. We, the gas price is too high. Why don't you just go buy an electric car, you know what I mean? I don't think they understand. People can't just go out and do that. But they wouldn't understand because they've always had everything given to them. I'm not saying that's always the case, but that's, that's what I picture in my mind. I, I think that's the case with Rehoboam. Now it's my time to be king. Never did any work to get that kingdom. You know, never did anything to earn the respect of the people. All of a sudden, he just stands up and says, I'm in charge. And his head gets big, and he says, like, you know, what am I going to do? I'm going to seek the counsel. He doesn't like the counsel that's given to him by the older men, so he goes to the younger men, and, and there are other spoiled rich kids probably, or kids that say, like, oh, man, if I was, I say kids, I'm, they weren't little kids, but, you know, if I was in charge, I would do this. I would do that. Maybe they got in their mind, like, what a good uh, kingdom looks like. They're kind of disillusioned into thinking that, you know, if you're going to be a good king, then you're going to do this, and, and uh, you're, you're not going to be easy on the people at all. You're going to be strict and, and uh, increase the punishment, increase the workload. After all, has, haven't many kings in the past done that? I mean, you could go back to Egypt. That was the mentality they had. Somebody asked for a little bit of mercy, what would they do? Hey, you guys are just being uh, lazy, and so I'm going to increase your workload. I'm going to put it, I think, make things harder for you. And, and, and there are a lot of kings and rulers in the world that kind of have that mentality. You know, I've got to be tougher. I've got to be uh, more strict. I've got to be, you know, punish harder or whatever. Well, I want to remind you of verse uh, 7. Now, this was the case of 
Uh, this was a case of this man who's a king. He, you know, doesn't do anything to work. This is just this position is just given him. And I told you the first thing I think about is politics. The second thing I think about is kids in the ministry, okay? Kids who have a ministry position just handed to them, who've never earned that, never, never worked for that or whatever. And, uh, and this is very common. And it makes sense in a way because it's a skill that a parent knows, and so he naturally wants his children to kind of follow in his footsteps or whatever. But the real danger in Christianity and in different churches and maybe even movements or Bible colleges or something like that, the great danger is that a man is going to get to this position where he's got all this stuff that he, he worked hard to get, and obviously the Lord was in charge. That's kind of what the message is going to be about. But, uh, but he gets all this stuff and hands it over to his son. And therefore, he takes the ministry. And I've seen it a lot of times where it, it plays out a lot like this, where the guy comes in just thinking like, hey, now I'm in charge, and, and he wants to start doing this and changing that and getting the advice from the young people and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, man, I don't think you understand how this works. I don't think you've understood, you know, what ministry is all about. <clears throat> and I brought this up in last message, I believe, on this series, but... You know, not only is that the case in a church situation or the fact of ministry, but also is the case in the in um, is the the case of a king or somebody who's given a le leadership over any people group, whether it's the workforce or whatever. They, as leaders, are supposed to be servants. Okay, so what did I say? Verse seven. Here was the advice of the old men, and they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and will serve them, not they're not greedy, they're not talking about themselves, they're not asking for an easy load because they don't want to work or something like that. They're giving wise counsel, saying, like, here's how you get the heart of the people, here's how you really be a help to them, and all this. It says, if you will serve the people, <clears throat> and he answer, uh, uh lost my, my spot here. He says, uh, if you will be a servant unto the people this day and will serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. That doesn't mean that, you know, you would never have to ask, you would never ask them to do something rough. It doesn't mean you would never have to speak roughly with them. I mean, it says speak good words. And so you get this idea that, you know, oh, he's, they're just telling him, hey, always be just sweet and, and kind and never stand up, uh, you know, for yourself or something like that. No, he's not saying any of that. They're just saying, be a servant to the people. Whereas that younger crowd is saying, make them serve you. Two different mindsets of leadership. And the mindset that's going to work every time is the position where somebody in a leadership position says, I'm going to serve them. And so whether it is a husband serving his family, you know, a father serving his kids, uh, CEO of a company serving the serving his employees, uh, a pastor serving the 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 flock, so to speak. Uh, that's what they're in that position to do, and that's the way that it's supposed to work. Is that they serve the people, the people in return uh, are loyal to them and help them to do the job that they've been called to do, and what have you. So this uh, was the case with uh, Rehoboam that he didn't serve the people. He got up there and he saw himself as this high person in authority. Uh, he thinks he's all-powerful. He thinks he is in charge, and everybody's going to have to do what he says, even, no matter how rough he is on them and everything. But look at verse 16. Boy, did he, little did he know. So 1 Kings 12, 16. <clears throat> so when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to thine own house, David, uh, not see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Okay, so here's what happens. You got all these people, they came to Rehoboam, they found out he was going to be the new king, and they said, I tell you what, will serve you if you kind of have mercy on us and listen to us and, and, and give us some of the things that we need to be able to run this country. We'll serve you. If you make the light, 
the, the load lighter. Of course, Rehoboam refuses that, so they say, okay, have it your way. And they just cease to, you know, you, you remember whenever they said, not my president, you know, it was just like, not my king. <laughs> they just refused it. They just decided that we're not going to listen to him, we're not going to obey him. And, uh, and so the, he tries to, uh, he sees himself as being all possible. I mean, I'm sorry, he sees himself as being all powerful. And then number two, he tries to take action over the people. Seeing himself in this position, who cares what they think about me? Who cares if they say they're not going to obey me? Who cares if they say, well, what portion have we in David? He says, no, nope, I'm going to take action, and I'm just going to keep things going as they were, and everybody will have to listen to me. Look at verse uh, 19. So he sends Adoram, Adoram, however you pronounce it, <laughs> verse uh, 17. But at, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 18. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones that he died. Therefore, King Rehoboam made speed to get him to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. Can you imagine, you know, we don't live in that kind of a kingdom where the, the, the you know, the tax collector comes knocking on your door and asks you for, you know, to pay your taxes or something like that. But in a case, that's what he did. He sent this guy who was the tax collector. He was over the tribute. And it's like, all right, time to pay up, Israel. Sends him out there to get the taxes. And could you imagine the guy from the IRS knocks on your door and says, hey, you haven't paid your taxes yet. And everybody in that community just took out stones and just stoned him to death. Like, uh, you talk about the Boston Tea Party. I mean, this is like another step, <laughs> you know, <laughs> You want us to pay taxes, huh? We'll show you what we think about that and just stone him to death. And <laughs> it's like all of a sudden, uh, Rehoboam has a reality check, okay? Rehoboam realizes, you know what? I'm not really in charge the way that I thought I was in charge. So let's keep reading. Uh, so Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. And it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congreg congregation and made him king over all Israel. Talking about Jeroboam now. He's the, uh, the one that was promised to be over the ten, ten tribes. <laughs> there was none that followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. And Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem. Uh, I'm sorry. When Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin and a hundred and fourscore thousand chosen men, which were warriors, to fight against the house of Israel, to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word of God came unto Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and unto all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, ye shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren, uh, the children of Israel." Return every man to his house, for this thing is from me. They hearken, therefore, to the word of the Lord and return to depart according to the word of the Lord. So at least at this point, Rehoboam says, you know what? I'm going to have to do what God said. And he departs, and quite honestly, you don't hear much about him for the, in the rest of the Bible except for his death, and there might be another mention of him before. So, you know, next week we'll pick up on, on Jer the life of Jeroboam, or next time, yeah, I guess that'll be next week. But uh, so the application that I want to make, okay, so he has this uh, reality check when he realizes, you know, here I thought I was in charge. Here I thought that I was going to be the boss and I was going to do, you know, but man, it, it, it wasn't as easy as, as he thought. So let me give you three points here for application. Number one, kings and rulers only think they're in charge. Now, I'm not telling you to be arrogant and have this attitude, you're not the boss of me. Like, the Bible speaks against that. We're not supposed to despise governments. We're not supposed to dishonor uh, the ones, the, the dignitaries, the ones who are in charge and what have you. That's not supposed to be our attitude. But, well, and, and, and let me, let's go a step further. Let me say this. I don't believe as a pastor, really as a Christian in many ways, I don't believe I would ever take up arms and say, you know what, that's it, it's time for a military takeover, and 
get out the militia and we're just going to get our country back. I hear people talk about that all the time. What do you, do you think we're getting to that point? You think we're going to have to do this and do that? And I might sometimes give mixed messages because of the fact that I'll say, I think there's a time when from a human perspective, a nation such as ours that was started in, you know, uh, based on freedom and, and, and all that, and we have the Constitution, we have all this stuff. I believe there's a time, just as patriots, as the United, United States citizens, where they would say, like, you know what? We've gone so far, we're not willing to live in these conditions anymore, and so we're going to take up arms and we're going to get our country back. I'm not going to stop, I mean, I'm not going to preach against that or say that that's wrong, because obviously our nation has seen that kind of stuff many times in the past, and that's what kept, uh, kept our freedoms. But here's what I will say. As a Christian, and especially as a pastor, I'm not going to take up arms. I'm not going to join the fight because the Bible makes it very clear this isn't my home. The Bible makes it very clear that uh, I wrestle not against flesh and blood. Okay, my, my, spirit, my battle is a spiritual battle. Now, if people are at war and they hate the government and the government's going after them and people are trying to shut this down and shut that down, my prayers for our government is that they will make laws that will allow us as a church to keep going, to keep uh, preaching the gospel, to keep meeting and assembling. And should it ever come a time where they tell us not to do that, we would just do it anyway <laughs> because we've got to obey God rather than man. So what if they put you in jail? Jesus said they will put you in jail one day. It's, it's going to happen. Okay, so all we do is we keep preaching, we keep doing the work. I don't think it's my job, my, you know, call in life to pick up arms and, and, and go to battle. But do I realize that in our country and Americans standing up for the rights, it might come to that? Well, sure, sure. And so the reality is, with that being said, uh, kings only think that they're in charge. You know, I remember when, uh, excuse me for using a carnal illustration here, but uh, I remember when that movie A Bug's Life came out, an animated uh, kids movie, well, I say kids movie, but I guess adults enjoyed it just as much as kids. But A Bug's Life came out, and this is an animated movie where these ants are, in, they're, they're slaves to the, uh, the grasshoppers. And the grasshoppers, there's only a few of them. It's just like a couple, of, like maybe three, maybe a guy that is in charge, and then he's got two brothers or something like that. I can't remember exactly. And basically, they've enslaved this whole colony of ants, and they make them, you know, save up, a certain amount of food for them each day. And, I mean, each, each year they have to, like, present all this food to them. And so they barely have enough to eat their, you know, their own food. And then they have to say, uh, uh, you know, set up food uh, for this, for these, their government is the implication, right, for their leaders, uh, their rulers. And the, the idea is at one point you realize what they're saying, and the grasshoppers even talk about this, like, hey, we got to keep them busy. We got to keep them distracted because they don't realize that there's way more of them than there are of us. And all they would actually have to do is just rise up against us, and there's nothing we could do uh, to stop them. And, uh, and that's kind of like a, a critical part of the movie. That's the point that's being made. And, of course, in the end, they do kind of rise up against them. Man, you didn't, didn't know that A Bug's Life was calling for, uh, <laughs> calling for a uh, revolutionary war or something like that. <laughs> but, uh, but that is true, isn't it? I mean, so you got a handful of people, spoiled rich kids, that were handed the nation on a, you know, on a platter. They don't even know what they're doing. And, you know, all it would take is for a whole bunch of people to get together and say, no, you know, we're not going to go that direction. I'm not advocating for that. I just told you I'm not going to ever get involved. But, <laughs> but the reality is, from a biblical standpoint, the king or the ruler or whatever, man, let them get a puffed up head. Let them think that he's in charge if you want, but the reality is God's in charge. Look at uh, Proverbs 21. And this is why as Christians, uh, we want to first and foremost seek the Lord, and get on our knees and pray to God for his protection before we worry so much about going, I'm not saying there's never a time to do it, but worry so much about writing letters to our politicians and doing this and doing that. I hear a lot of people say like, well, you can't pray and, and, and expect God's going to do something and then not do the work. So they say you got to lobby things, you got to protest, you got to do all these things. I don't think so. I think God will take care of it. Preach to the people. The people are going to live their lives. They're not going to stand for uh, a dictatorship. And when the time comes, they'll, they'll know what to do. But 
Proverbs 21, verse 1. Now that you've already read it. 21, verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. <clears throat> so, it's not, I'm not advocating here that the king has no free will. Like he's only going to do what God tells him to do. He has free will. He can make his own decisions. But at the end of the day, God can make sure that those decisions all lead to the same place. Okay, which is his will. How many times did we see as we're studying through the life of Moses? You know, like it looks like they're going one direction and then it ends up right back where God said it was going to be anyway. And, it, and it's just like God knows. And he's going to get you there one way or another, no matter how much you fight it, no matter what, you know, how long it takes you to get there. Eventually you'll see it his way and things will happen his way. And it's the same thing. If a king rises up against the people, you know, uh, ultimately he's not as in charge as he thinks he is. God is. Okay. And in many ways the people are in the sense that God can deliver over to the people uh, the nation, and that's what he did with, in this time. Okay, second application. When you feel overconfident in your position, whatever it is, okay, leadership position, whatever, when you feel overconfident, you better seek the Lord. You better not come into something saying, man, look at me, I'm in charge, I'm so powerful, or whatever, because God will knock you down, he'll humble you, he likes you to be in a position where you're seeking him. And, uh, and this is what we see again. Rehoboam is supposed to represent God's people. He's supposed to be, uh, you know, he's the son of David, the grandson of David. He's supposed to be the man of God leading God's people, and he does. He ends up still leading Ju Judah, even though, uh, you know, it's an unfortunate situation that had to happen. He still ends up leading Judah. Eventually, you know, it's passed down, and Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah uh, so God still had his way there, but look, he sure humbled Rehoboam, right? Rehoboam thought he had it all figured out. He thought he was going to rule his way, and then he realized, I got no power. There's nothing I can do, and he backed down. Now, he could have he could have stood up and said, oh, yeah, I'll just make it rougher, okay? You're going to keep fighting that game. I'll, I'll send you, uh, uh, you know, I send you one tax collector, and you killed him. Now I'll send you, you know, an army of tax collectors. He could have just kept that going. But he realized, hey, God is in charge. And he kind of, there was a little bit of humility there. So, number one, kings and rulers only think they're in charge. Number two, when you feel overconfident in your leadership position, you better seek the Lord. Number three, always, this has got to be the mind of every Christian and then every person in whatever God gives you, whatever charge God gives you over people, even if you're just a parent, I don't mean just a parent, even if you're a parent, that's a sense of leadership, that's a role. And here is the solution to being a good leader. Serve God and serve people. God's first, we're going to do everything his way, right? Even if the people say, no, we want to do it a different way, you've got to obey God rather than man. But not only that, you've got to do what it is, what's necessary to serve the people to listen to them, to understand them, to know uh, what's best for them. And again, it doesn't matter if you're a parent, it doesn't matter if you're the, you know, the boss of a company or whatever, like it's your job to find out how I can serve the people, how I can take care of them, how I can provide for them, what's going to be best for them. And it's not about you just ruling and being in charge and, and oh yeah, well I'll show you and how much can I get from these people and all that kind of stuff. If you go down that road, you're in big trouble because God wants us to serve him and he wants to serve others. And isn't that what everything in the Bible is all about? All the commandments, Jesus said, they can you know, be summarized in two points. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Love thy neighbor as thyself. That's really the Christian life. Love God, love others, and you know what? God then can use you to do great things and be a great leader. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this story of uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And just another reminder, there's so many in your word about how we need to stay humble, follow you, serve others, and how in doing so you'll give us great peace and give us joy, and, uh, and uh, you'll be glorified uh, from it. But when we seek our own gratification and, our, and, and seek our own power and wealth or whatever, uh, Lord, every time we, it messes us up and you humble us. 
So I pray that you help us learn our lesson, learn it quickly, and to bring glory to you by uh, by following these principles. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, 